and we're recording. You may begin, Bill. Thank you. Good evening. I'm William Connors of the Solid Waste and Recycling Advisory Committee. This open meeting of the committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of the public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will not feature public comment. For this meeting, the committee is convening by Zoom app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may not be able to see you and that take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Now, to confirm that we have a quorum, the committee and that, uh, to confirm that we have a quorum of the committee and that everyone can hear and be heard, I will call out the name of each member. Please respond that you are here by, uh, and can hear the meeting. Board members, Wells Blanchard. I'm here and I can hear you. David Eskidi. I'm here and I hear you. Stephen Rosenstock. I'm here and I hear you. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, uh, permit me to cover some ground rules. For effective and clear conduct of business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. As for the first order of business, I will ask for a motion that the meeting will continue at, will continue at the next posted meeting of the committee if a technical problem develops. Is there a motion? Motion. Seconded. Okay, now we will take a roll call vote. Uh, Wells Blanchard. Aye. David Eskcity. Yes. Stephen Rosenstock. Yes. And William Connors. Yes. Okay. And now to the agenda, which Dave, I do not have in front of me here. Mr. Vice Chair, the uh, first item is the approved minutes of the prior meetings, which is uh, October 29th, 2020. Mr. Chair, I move that uh, we accept the minutes of that date as presented. I have comments. Oh, okay. Mr. Essidy, your, your comments? Can I, can I proceed? Yes. Okay. Um, in the discussion section, oh no, before that, um, my name is misspelled. How do so you spell it? It is E-C-S-E-D-Y, not E-S-C-E-D-Y. Okay, I'll correct that. Okay. In the discussion section, um, there's, there was a discussion about um, the Goodwill trailer being closed at the RTS. And I 
I made what I thought was a, um, a good comment, um, something like Mr. Exidy noted that Arlington Goodwill is and has been open. Can you repeat that comment again, Dave? Um, I noted that the Arlington, the um, town of Arlington Goodwill trailer is and has been open during the pandemic. Okay, so you would like that to be entered into the minutes? Yes. Okay. In the appropriate place in discussion. And then under adjournment, um, it was noted that the vote there was two yeas and, and no nays. But I was, I know that I was part of the meeting at that point. And so at least Heller, Connors, and Exidy voted to adjourn. So it's just the point being that I was there for the whole meeting and um, I, so it really is th at least three yays. Okay, because I thought you had left and I didn't see your picture. I, did, I, I, I was there to the very, the bloody end. I okay, was also the I first one to, to um, um, after uh, Dave to uh, sign on, so. Okay, because when I and looked others, at the- Others came and went during the meeting. Okay, because your screen went blank, so I thought you'd left. I, I'm sorry if that, I, there may be a technical problem, but, but I did vote, but I did vote to adjourn. Okay. All right, I can change and, that. And, and in a sense, it's important just because we have a quorum. <laughs> Are there any other comments from the committee? I don't believe I had a second to my motion. Uh, I actually seconded it, but then that's a, a second. Okay. Mr. Vice Chair, I think it would be appropriate if the mover of the motion and the seconder would uh, move it with the proposed amendments. Good point. So uh, I move to approve the minutes with the amendment. I'll second that. Okay. And then we will put that to a vote. So uh, Wells Blanchard. Uh, yes. David Excudy? Yes. Stephen Rosenstock? Yes. And William Connors? Yes. So the minutes are accepted. Okay. David, do you the next want on? Agenda item is the superintendent's report. Well, good evening. It's nice to see you all. It's been a while since we last uh, got together. I think it was October, someone said, and it's just a reflection of how, fa how fast time goes by. Um, but it's nice to see you all. And this evening, uh, you did see the agenda that I had prepared. Uh, and really, it's an opportunity to kind of discuss what has happened over the last fiscal year, uh, which would have been FY20. And then uh, this fiscal year, touching on some some issues that I wanted to bring to your attention um, that have been going on at the transfer station. So it's a fair amount of information. I did prepare a PowerPoint presentation that I'd like to share with you. And uh, given the nature of, the, of everyone here, we, we all know each other. If you do have any questions uh, or anything like that as I go through the presentation, please don't hesitate to just um, ask away. So I'm gonna to attempt to screen share here and let's see what happens. And here we go. Um, so just an overview of what I'd like to discuss with you this evening. Um, we do have a number of capital projects that are ongoing or that have actually uh, either in the process of beginning or will begin very soon at the uh, transfer station. 
like to take a look at some information on our trash and recycling tonnages. Uh, also look at recycling cost and revenues. Our trash disposal costs, looking at both what our hauling costs are and our tip fees at Wheel Liberator. I'd like to begin having a discussion about our existing uh, Wheel of contract. It is due to expire in 2026. And while that does seem like a long ways away, it's never too early to start looking at uh, a contract as important to the town as our uh, Wheel of contract. We have a range of other contracts. Again, this is just more informative information. I know we have, uh, you know, Wells is a new member. I'd like to make sure that he's up to speed on a lot of this information give you an operational update, and then talk about some anticipated fiscal year 22 activities at the transfer station. So we have three capital projects that are funded, contracts are signed, and they are all due to begin either in April or early May at the transfer station. This is a recent aerial view of the RTS and the first capital project will occur in the compost area, which is the area highlighted in yellow. Uh, this one particular, actually it's, it's one, it, it's, uh, it's two improvements, but they are under the title of the RTS stormwater improvements. So I'd like to focus in on area one, which is highlighted in red. That's the, the, the sedimentation basin uh, that's due to be constructed in the compost area. So it, that is the area in red. Uh, this is the compost area on a map, or on a, I should say a site plan, that Fuss and O'Neill prepared. Um, the, the challenge at the compost site right now is that the, the stormwater, it drains in a series of, uh, of unregulated directions, all spilling out into the wetlands, and the sediment is untreated and um, it's just it's not healthy for the the wetlands that surround the compost area so the idea here was to bring a consultant in and do a design that would treat the stormwater runoff before it was discharged into the wetlands uh, the dashed line there represents the area of work to the north of the dashed line in the compost area that will be relatively untouched it's the area to the south that is the project area if you look at the site plan, uh, the, the, the plan of record for the project, uh, the sedimentation basin is this area in red. And you can see uh, the outlines of the, of the sedimentation basins, the bays that are being constructed by the contractor. When all is said and done, the water that will shed throughout the compost area, the site will be graded such that the water drains into these basins. And the basins will function somewhat as a filter. The water uh, and the silt will settle into these, de these detention basins. The silt will obviously percolate to the bottom and the water will spill out over the top, in, in essence being much clearer and freer of silt and will be much healthier for the surrounding wetlands. If we look at the compost area right now, and this perhaps may be repetitive for some of you, given your, your history with the town, um, we know that in the far left-hand side, when you come to the compost area, you drop your brush off. After we have our quarterly brush grinds, we end up with this mulching material called ground up brush. This is a picture from last November. So it's our leaf drop off, our configuration for that heavy uh, season of leaf inundation. We lay out the leaves, the browned up brush, uh, and the grass in these compost windrows that basically cure for four or five months. Then we run that material through our trommel screener and out one end comes the finished product, the compost, and out the other end comes the tailings, which is basically the waste product associated with the composting of those materials. So that's really, that's how the composting operation um, is set up right now. If you look at this photo, this was taken from the landfill about a month ago. And you can see that the site has largely been cleared. Uh, this is the work area. And I took this just uh, about one o'clock this afternoon and you can see the contractors are already there. Uh, they, have, they began work today and we're anticipating uh, by next week the project will be underway. So we're excited about that. With regard to area three, 
Area three is the expanded detention basin. So that area in the red triangle is the existing detention basin um, at the foot of the landfill. And the detention basin, as I'm sure many of you are aware, function, functions as the repository for stormwater runoff. And it's designed to handle significant uh, stormwater flows in the event of a 100, 200, or 500 year rain event. So the water basically drains into the detention basin through a series of engineer design swales on the landfill face. Uh, this again is the Fuss and O'Neill uh, plan of record for the project. Uh, the expanded detention basin is called out in that red triangle. And the expanded detention basin will handle the additional stormwater flow from the materials processing area improvements. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. And from the new paved road, which is a new impervious surface uh, that we hope to build next year behind the salt shed. And I'll come up, I'll touch on that in just a few minutes as well. So the heading here is the RTS stormwater improvements area two. Now area two is going to town meeting to request funding um, but the way area two will look is, this is an overlay of the improved materials processing area. If you've been out there recently, you've probably noticed behind the salt shed, all of the new interlocking block bays. We hired a consultant and they designed that new row that will be paved behind the salt shed. It's presently, it's presently pervious, basically mud in the winter. It will be impervious after it's paved. And the area three project, the expanded detention basin will handle the majority of the stormwater from this impervious improvement at the transfer station. That's one of the reasons for it. Another capital project that we anticipate beginning at the end of April or the beginning of May is the, uh, the transfer building renovation project. This project came about as a result of a series of evaluations that were done by Weston and Sampson on the transfer station building. And among the Weston and Sampson recommendations from their evaluation that are called for as part of the capital improvement is to power wash, prime, and paint the interior structural steel of the building, to install new steel purlins and girts where necessary, to adjust cross bracing, to repair damage, mostly wear and tear, to the uh, concrete tipping floor. And this is a photo of the, the tipping floor. Actually, this was taken last year and it's actually worse uh, now than it was last year. And to provide for fall protection, a, a fall protection warning barrier to prevent people from falling into the loading pit. So those are the improvements that will begin later this month or early next month. Again, the contract's been designed. We just don't have a construction schedule in place yet. The third capital improvement project to begin this month is the safety fence installation. Uh, what is, uh, what will happen there is the contractor Premier Fence will be installing new swing gates. We're gonna relocate the back swing gates. This is the back gate and this is more or less the contractors and the staff's entrance into the facility. We're gonna relocate that about 75 or 80 feet back further into the facility to get traffic, uh, or to get trailers, I should say, heavy equipment off of Central Avenue when they're turning into the gates. And we're installing about 125 feet of new six foot high chain link fence. And really the idea here is to make the RTS a little bit more secure, to make it a little more challenging for residents or, or anybody who wants to get into the facility when it's closed, to make it a little bit more challenging to do so. It's really an effort just to make the site more secure when, when no one's there. And this yellow line basically outlines where the new swing gates, the relocated back gate, and that new 125 length of chain link fence will be placed. So let's talk a little bit about trash tonnages and recycling tonnages. Um, if we get a snapshot of the last few fiscal years, this tells you um, uh, from July through June of each, of each year, so FY 18, 19, 20, 21, um, how much solid waste we've generated. And I wanted to bring this to your attention because we have been seeing significantly more trash coming into the facility uh, since COVID. Um, 
people are home more, they're buying more, and thus they're disposing more. And so uh, I feel we're probably on pace to exceed where we were in FY20 with regard to our trash tonnages. Um, if you, I wanted to bring some numbers to your attention. If you look at FY21, and if you look at July, September, October, December, and then just last month in March, you'll notice those months we exceeded 800 tons in trash. Um, and if you look at some of the other months, we do have a few months where we exceeded 800 tons. We actually have a month back in FY18, I highlighted it in yellow, where we had 900 tons. Um, but those are fairly rare. And, uh, but I bring to your attention the 800 ton plus months in FY21, because that's more indicative of the kind of waste flows that we're seeing. So I'm anticipating probably having a, another year at the conclusion of FY21 that exceeds where we were in FY20. So our trash trailer tonnages, or actually I should say our number of, of trailers. So again, looking through FY18 through FY21, these are the number of 100 yard trash trailers that we send from the transfer station to Wheeler, Brader, and Millbury. FY18, 379, we had a fairly low, I've never really figured out why, but a low year in FY19, kind of rebound at FY20, and we are on track to either be right at or exceed where we were last fiscal year. I'm anticipating probably being around 380 um, uh, trailer trips. Uh, and again, it's just a reflection of the additional trash that we are seeing at the transfer station this year. So let's take a look at some uh, recycling uh, tonnages. As you know, uh, we are dual stream at the transfer station. So we take uh, commingled, which is uh, glass bottles, steel and tin cans, and plastic containers. And again, these are tonnages. So you can see uh, FY20, one, we're at 569 tons now. We have three months left in the fiscal year. And so I anticipate we're probably going to be right at about where we were last fiscal year, six, uh, 760, 770, somewhere in that neighborhood, unless we have uh, some kind of a, a month that I'm not anticipating. But again, I'm not anticipating any, any surprises for the rest of the fiscal year. With regard to single stream, um, I just kind of throw these out there to kind of give you a, a little snapshot of of, um, of our tonnages. Um, I'm assuming that we're probably going to be just uh, at about or a little bit less than where we were uh, last fiscal year. Tonnage wise, mixed paper. We're probably going to exceed um, where we were uh, in FY20 based upon where we are right now. And with cardboard, uh, we certainly will exceed where we are right now with cardboard. We're seeing massive volumes of cardboard coming into the facility. It's the Amazon effect. And uh, that trend will very likely continue. So some of our recycling costs and revenues. So I, I do track uh, all of this information in a variety of spreadsheets. So when we look at July of 2019 through June of 2020, and then through July of 2020 through April, of 2021, there are a number of things that we notice. So with regard to cost and revenues, this is a little bit of a clunky table here, but bear with me. What I'm trying to show is that between FY19 and 20, the cost that the, the municipality had to bear to recycle commingled increased by about 45%. So that cost increased about 45% from where it was the prior fiscal year. Single stream, those costs went down. New, the mixed paper or the news as we call it, that cost also decreased between FY19 and FY20. And yet the cardboard revenues uh, increased dramatically. They basically went from $0 in, in revenue to $51. So between FY20 and FY21, we saw the cost for commingled actually significantly decrease. We also saw the cost for single stream decrease. And we saw the recycling costs for newspaper go down as well. And recycling of cardboard resulted in greater revenues. 
So this is really just kind of a snapshot to show you that between FY20 and FY21, our recycling costs are coming down and our revenues for cardboard are increasing. And so what, what I can anticipate in, in, in talking with our recycling contractor, Casella Recycling, they've, they've echoed that there's no doubt that the value of paper and the value of cardboard will continue to increase. And there's a number of factors associated with that. And they're, they're really no brainer factors. I think everybody recognizes that the economy is beginning to do better. We're getting out of the COVID um, economic crisis that we were in. And, and again, with regard to, to cardboard, it's just it's the Amazon effect. Everyone seems to be buying online nowadays and the cardboard demands um, are increasing and thus it's a supply demand issue. I asked our specialist to run some numbers for me for tonight's meeting. I wanted to let you know about you know, some of the observations that we're keeping track of out there. So when you look at um, when you look at 2015 through 2020, and this is calendar year, this is not fiscal year, this is, this is calendar year, these are revenues, just for the trash that comes in that goes over the scale. So this would be commercial tonnage or residential tonnages, which we refer to as bulky waste. And we haven't changed the tip fee, the tip fee has stayed the same, 140 per ton over the scale. But you can see that we our revenues have increased fairly substantially, and it's a reflection of just the you know we're we're not taking in a whole lot more waste from other communities or anything like that. I mean, we we, we are I am issuing stickers to uh, contractors who do business in Needham, but they may not be from Needham, but they use the transfer station, but but not in exorbitant numbers. But it's simply a reflection of the fact that Needham is producing more trash, because I, I assume it's because more people are buying. More people are working from home and they're consuming more. But regardless, it's resulting in more revenue coming into the facility and that's bulky waste going over the scale. I wanted to touch uh, on cardboard because it is a revenue stream and just give you a little bit of a, a little snapshot about the fluctuating value of that commodity. So if you go back and look through 2019, beginning in January all the way through to the present time, you can see it's a roller coaster ride. Um, but where we are now is um, we're at $69.40 per ton for the cardboard that we sent to Casella Recycling. And um, based upon everything I've read and I've heard, uh, I do not anticipate that that number will do anything but continue to go up. Um, so it's good news for us because obviously that's more money coming into the town and less going out to pay for that service. And the tonnages continue to increase as well. Um, I did include a link uh, below that I can be happy to send out to folks in an email if you're interested, but there's so much information online um, about you know, uh, you know the the value of cardboard from a recycling perspective. I tend to to utilize resource recycling. It's a free website, um, and there's just a, a whole host of articles there that I think are very interesting and could, could provide some supplemental information about this topic if you were interested. Um, and again, I just kind of include this as a, as more of a visual. Um, it's a visual representation of the table, um, but. Uh, it, just basically shows the fluctuation in the value of cardboard, but the trends is good for Needham with regard to the value of that commodity that we're recycling. Hey, uh, Greg, um, can you go back just a couple slides? Um, yes. And then this is me, my, I'm sure my ignorance, but so the, the revenues here have gone up. That's because we're, we charge money for the municipal solid waste that comes into us. Um, is, but there's a cost for us to then deal with that. Is that, um, is that included in the trash tonnages? table or is that trash tonnage is only the non-municipal? That's a good question. So, so the, 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 let me go back here a little bit. And if we look at, if we look at this table, this table is inclusive of commercial trash, residential bulky, yellow pay you to throw bag trash, and all of the trash that will be collected by our packer truck from schools, 
municipal buildings, and public fields. Does that from anybody? No. Does that answer okay, your so, question? I think so. So you mentioned that part of this was due to COVID, but um, it sounds like part of it may also be due to increased municipal volume. So we're, we're not seeing huge amounts of additional pay, yellow pages if they trash. We're, we're, we are seeing some, but most of the trash that we're seeing, uh, the additional waste is coming from contractors, whether that's the larger contractors who utilize the RTS, such as the, you know, John Timmerman, or some of the smaller uh, Needham haulers bringing material in, but we are seeing a significantly, a significant increase and the, the, the residents in their F-250s coming in with trailers, just bringing trash in. Gotcha. Yeah, I, okay. And yeah, Greg, I mean, I think what you're saying is that more, you know, the, the newer residents coming into the town aren't interested in buying yellow bags and going and dr dropping it off. So you're having more commercial haulers that are bringing stuff to the dump. Well, you know, Steve, I think maybe another way to think about that is the material that people are bringing into the transfer station. I think if they figured they could, they could save some money and stuff it in yellow bags and handle it that way, they probably would. But what they're doing is they're just they're bringing in bulky waste that can't be, that can't easily be placed in the containers, you know, what, what smashed up and put into a yellow bag or whatever. And it's just faster and easier to stick it into a trailer, attach it to the back of your truck and pull it over the scale. And in some instances, the math actually works out. Because we, what we'll do is, is the scale operator will look at it and say, okay, you know, we're only going to charge you five bucks for this or ten bucks for that. You know, we have a we have a, a um, uh, we have a set of fees that allows for the operator, to, the scale operator, to to assess and to charge fees or to go over the scale. But regardless, like I said, we're not seeing huge increases in the yellow pages of throw bag trash. We are seeing that that material, that bulky waste coming into the facility. Hmm. Karis, you had a thought. Yeah, I just want to make sure that there's just a clarity of language here. So I just, um, is the question, what is municipal solid waste? Like, what does it consist of? Um, or is the question more about um, how does that municipal solid waste get processed? I think that, I think I was just trying to get a sense for, there's got to be an offset. These are revenues, right? Um, but there's got to be an offsetting cost. So I just wanted to make sure that I understood how, where that was being displayed. And I think it's in the trash tonnages. So Wells, what, uh, what I do have coming up in a slide is a snapshot of some costs. So you can take a look at the, re now understand that the revenue here that's shown in this slide is just the scale revenue. There's also bag revenue from the sales of yellow bags. And there's other revenue that we collect in the sale of composting and we charge for recycling of tires and, and you know, CFCs and CRTs and things like that. So there's, there's, there's quite a few sources of revenue um, for the RTS. So what I, I just wanna be sure that when we start looking at revenues that we understand that the information I'm providing tonight is not a complete snapshot of all the revenues that are coming in. It's a snapshot of some of the revenues, but again, I'm just using this more informationally to say, that the trends are that we are seeing a significant amount of bulky material coming in over the scales and thus is reflected in this table. Thank you. Um, Jeff, hello, I have a question, Jeff here. Sorry, I'm late. Um, can you hear me or? Yes, yep. hi Jeff. All right. It's surprising to me that there's this increase of over the scale. So you're saying that you know, Joe Average Needham has figured out that to how to use the scale, and is that older people or residents or, or newer residents who've actually figured that out? And and are you saying that we also voted at a minimum over the scale uh, several years ago? Is there you're saying there's some flexibility given the fact that people are are doing that on a smaller scale now? So, well, I, I want to be careful. I'm not trying, I, I, I don't think I'm trying to characterize it quite the way you said, Jeff. I, think what I'm, I don't think people are really trying to game the system. I think what we're seeing is people are doing a lot of cleanups. I mean, I, I, I mean, I clean up my basement once and I'm basically done for a year. It seems like people are cleaning up their basements and their garages every weekend. And we're just <laughs> seeing all this waste come in. 
Um, and it's, it, it is of a composition that's not easily placed into the, into the containers at the drop-off walls. So what people right. are doing is they're loading up their cars, they're loading up their trucks, they're loading up their trailers, and they're actually going to the scale, driving over, getting weighed and, and, and tipping. Now, what we are also seeing is people coming in with their cars or their trucks and they've got a couch in the back or they've got a, they've got a you know, rolled up carpet. And instead of going over the scale, they pull up to the transfer station and the scale operator says, okay, that's $10 to get rid of that rug or it's 10 bucks to get rid of the, the couch. So okay. no one's gaming the system. It's I wasn't, simply I wasn't that, suggesting it. I okay. wasn't suggesting the, ga the gaming. And I was just, it's surprising to think that people have figured out, you know, <laughs> how to use the scale, uh, you know, um, you know, well, we, we certainly welcome the fact that people know how to utilize the scale because it certainly cuts down on the confusion um, and, and, and any queue lines. And, and the staff does a fabulous job of managing that. Um, but again, I, I just think what I wanted to represent tonight was that we're seeing a lot more bulky trash coming uh, into the facility and it's, it's reflected in the increased revenues that are, that are going to the town um, uh, through, through over the scale service. Now that must give you some worry, uh, some pause, thinking that now you have so many other people coming over the scale and dropping it off with the condition of the tipping floor that you just like you just showed us. I've, mm -hmm. you know, I've been there and never noticed that hole because it's probably uh, that breaking up of the concrete because it's probably full of garbage, uh, you know, but um, or, or you know, garbage hiding the damage. But that's got to be somewhat worrisome when you got so much more traffic of your know, amateurs, um, so to speak. Uh. Well, we, we do our best. Uh, the staff does, I think, a very good job of uh, traffic control. And one of the things that I didn't mention, but, it, but you, this may be a good introduction to this, is when that capital project begins, uh, later this month or early next month, um, because the floor in the tip building will be repaired, basically it's gonna be the, the, the existing hole in the concrete floor will be cut out and it will be patched. And that building we anticipate will be basically out of service for five or six weeks until that concrete cures to the point where we can put the equipment back on it and handle the waste as we presently are doing. And so we've had to think about how we are going to maintain existing operations and the tempo of the operations during that five or six week period. And we've come up with what we think are good plans that will allow us to maintain the operation in the present tempo and, and not interrupt services. So we, we've we spent a lot of time thinking about this and we think we've come up with a good plan. Thank you. Um, so, Again, more for some of the veterans here, perhaps this is repetitive, but I wanted to just bring to your attention some of these hauling costs. So, so uh, we, we know we've got revenue coming in from the sale of yellow bags. We know we have revenue coming in from, from the scale and from a, a number of other um, items that we charge for, but we also have expenses. And, and two of the principal expenses with regard to trash are our hauling costs. And in FY21, our hauling costs are $360 per trailer. And then we also pay a tip fee to get rid of our trash at Wheelabrator. And our present contracted tip fee is $69.82. So again, we have money coming in, which is great, but we also have an expense to handle that. Now this, this table is a little bit lunky, so bear with me, but we're looking at FY21 on the far left. And we see at present, we have sent to Wheelabrator 7,106 tons of trash. We know from the previous table that our transportation costs are $360 per trailer. We've sent 303 trailers to Millbury between July and March, and that expense has been $109,000. And that 7,106 tons of trash when it goes to Millbury, they charge us $69.82 per ton. That equals $496,141 between July and March for a grand total of about $605,000. So again, uh, 
you know, I, I, I don't have broken down for this evening, but I just wanted to put that out there that yes, we are bringing in money um, uh, for, for uh, over the scale revenue and for the sale of yellow bags. But again, there's a fairly significant expense to haul and to tip the trash at Millbury or at Willowbred or Millbury. I wanted to touch on what's, what's going on globally with regard to the recycling industry. So not long ago, most of our recovered fiber from Needham was being sent overseas by our recycling contractor, Casella Recycling, and it was going to China not long ago. And you can see India, Mexico, Vietnam, et cetera, were, were, were picking up the scraps. Largely, China was basically taking everything. However, not long ago, China basically overnight stopped that practice. And what we see now is that uh, China is taking very, very minor amounts. And India, in particular, has really stepped up to the plate, uh, followed by Vietnam and Mexico and, and some of these other, uh, other countries as well. So India now has become one of the principal export regions for uh, recovered fiber. Uh, from the United States. So it's just this, this, this shifting dynamic that's been going on, which I thought was kind of interesting. I just wanted to throw that out there in case you're wondering where our stuff is going. Let's take a look, talk a little bit about contracts. Um, so we have a number of contracts uh, at the RTS. Uh, Casella Recycling, as I just discussed, they are, have our existing contract to handle our, our dual stream Recycle uh, commodities, which is our cardboard, our single stream, our mixed paper, and our um, commingled material. That contract expires September of this year. Uh, Commonwealth Waste Transportation CW tree, uh, CWT, I'm sorry, they, hand, they do our trash hauling, and that contract expires very soon. New England Recycling, they do our brush grinding. And uh, that contract expires, but there are two one-year extensions and I'm recommending that that project, uh, that contract be extended, that they provide fabulous service to the town. Sean Harris just recently signed a contract with the municipality to, to haul catch basin cleanings, street sweepings, and compost tailings. And then wheel uh, They obviously do our trash disposal and that contract doesn't expire for another five years. So those are some of the larger um, contracts that we have in place uh, for operations at the RTS. Let's talk a little bit about Wheel of Brader. I wanted to talk about Wheel of Brader tonight because uh, unbeknownst perhaps to everyone on the call, um, Massachusetts uh, and New England is very quickly facing a crisis of capacity and how do we get rid of our trash? And I wanted to talk about that a little bit tonight because I feel that this is going to play strongly into what I anticipate the town will be looking at for tip fees to get rid of trash in the future. So I wanted to bring this to your attention tonight. So our current facility in Millbury, Wheel of Raider, they are permitted by the Department of Environmental Protection to, to burn or incinerate 1,500 tons of uh, trash every day. Uh, and as we talked about earlier this evening, Needham has sent you know, uh, about 9,000 in FY18, about 7,000 in FY19, and about another 9,000 in FY20, and we're probably on target to do about another 9,000 this fiscal year. Massachusetts has about 6.9 million people um, of that population, we generate about 6 million tons of trash annually, or about 0.87 tons per person. Of that 6 million tons, we incinerate about three and a quarter million tons. We export to New York, Ohio, some other southern states, about 1.5 million tons of trash. We recycle about 1.3 million tons, and we the landfill in New England not necessarily in Massachusetts, but in New England, we landfill about 600,000 tons of trash. Now, New England is rapidly losing its 
in state landfill capacity and we're not replacing it. And there's a number of factors for why that's happening. Since 2013, Massachusetts has lost 2.5 million tons of permitted landfill capacity. The projections that I've seen is that by 2017 or 27, there'll be an additional 6.4 million tons of landfill capacity lost. It will never return. What are the consequences of that? Well, more waste is gonna to have to be exported out of the state because there's no in-state capacity to handle that material. There are no new landfills being cited in Massachusetts. The cost of land is too high and the regulatory environment is not conducive to citing a new landfill. It just won't happen. Disposal prices are going to increase for in-state capacity or disposal, I should say. So whether it's the limited landfill capacity left, and there is some, or whether it's uh, waste to energy or incineration, those costs are going to increase. And I think it's important for the Department of Public Works and Needham to, to know that it's going to become more challenging to get rid of specialty soils. Now these are the street sweepings, the catch basin cleanings, and to a degree, the compost tailings that are presently being used as alternative daily cover on landfills. The alternative daily cover basically is in your landfill, you lay out your trash, you run it over with a bulldozer, you flatten it out, and then you put this alternative daily cover, which might be catch basin sweepings or, or catch basin cleanings, street sweepings, on top, and then a thin layer of soil, and then you start the whole process again. So as we close down our landfills, and as we have to resolve to export more of our waste, the challenge and the expense of getting rid of specialty soils is going to become more of a challenge for municipalities in Massachusetts. So I just wanted to kind of bring that to everyone's attention. There is presently no excess capacity in Massachusetts. There's just none. So if there's a significant weather event, a force majeure, if something happens to our capacity in Massachusetts, if a waste or energy facility goes down, there is no excess capacity to handle that in state. And it's gonna result, uh, uh, result likely in having that material have to be sent out of state at considerable expense. The waste or energy facilities in Massachusetts are aging. They're, the average age is about 30 years old no new facilities are being built or can be built because there's a moratorium on the development of new waste to energy capacity in Massachusetts. So the capacity we have is the capacity, or the, I should say the capacity we have now is the capacity we'll have in the future. And so the dynamics that I've laid out, no additional waste to energy, no new landfills, means that our waste will not be managed in Massachusetts largely in the future. It will all be managed out of state. Also, recycling rates have been largely for the last decade flat. Um, and, but I, I, just, I did want to point out the note there is that revenues are increasing, which is good, but the rates are relatively flat. So we're not going to recycle our way out of this dilemma. The trash will continue to be generated. It's gonna to need to be managed and sent someplace and recycling is not the panacea. Like I said earlier, the waste is exported to landfills in Ohio, New York, and other Southern states. Tip fees are lower uh, uh, for out-of-state landfills. There's just more real estate out in some of these Southern states. The cost of land is less. The regulatory environment is more friendly to landfilling than it is in Massachusetts. However, hauling waste from Massachusetts to Ohio, for instance, is not really sustainable. If that's one of your objectives is to make your municipality more sustainable, shipping your waste out of state is not a way to do it because it's very polluting. It's largely done through tractor trailers and through rail, which are both very, very heavy in diesel emittance. The other important factor to understand when you export trash is that you make yourself, in this case, Massachusetts makes its municipalities 
subject or susceptible to out-of-state regulations and laws. And so it, it can put you in a, in a situation that you may not have to deal with if you were handling that waste in state. The other thing that's important to understand is that while we are railing waste out of state, there are significant investments that need to be made in rail in order for us to rise to the challenge of exporting our waste because we're not building waste to energy plants and we're not creating any more landfills. And that infrastructure is what they call transloading. And so that means you're going to have to be able to take waste that's brought into a transfer station on, you know, in the back of packer trucks or in the back of 100 yard trailers and then get it onto a rail car. And that transload process is just not a lot of infrastructure out there. And so one of the things that everyone needs to be cognizant of is that as landfills close, as waste to energy plants mm -hmm. age out, and as waste continues to be generated, um, you know, we, we may have a classic bottleneck here where there's only so much transloading capability and yet there's all this waste that needs to be gotten rid of. So again, these are some, it's not a Needham problem necessarily, but it's an industry issue that the regulatory um, uh, people in Massachusetts um, need to be thinking about. Lastly, on this issue, you know, people will ask about new technology. And there is no, what we refer to as scalable technology on the horizon to deal with this issue. So there's, there, there's no magic bullet out there. There's, there's no light switch that can be flicked to, to solve this problem. There's nothing on the horizon for at least 10 years that will help deal with this crisis. So, so as I started you know, researching this and thinking about it and then talking to people and attending conferences and so on and, and learning more about this, you know, the idea of a trash contract expiring 2026 sounds like it provides the town significant time to think this through, and it does, but I don't think we want to miss an opportunity to begin talking about this, understanding the challenges that we may be facing, and provide ourselves time to think through options and come up with a good recommendation for us in the future. These, these you know, I've, I've, I've worked on this for a long time throughout my career. I know, I, you know, I've, I've gone through, a, um, you know, looking at, uh, looking at new contracts for municipalities and, and they take time, They're, they can be complicated. So I just wanted to bring it to your attention, explain the issues as best I understand them so that as we venture down this road, we, are, we kind of have a basis of, of information. With regard to operational updates. Hey Greg. So, did someone um, have a question? Yeah, this is Wells, um, yep. sorry. Um, just, can I try to summarize, um, well, one question I had is, is it possible to sign contracts for the future in advance? So that, because obviously things might get worse, and if you can convince somebody to lock in some kind of contract in the future, that could mitigate some of the risk. To answer your question, yes, that is possible. Okay. Is that something that we might be considering as part of what you're talking about there uh, as a kind of the future thinking? Um... Well, I, I, I certainly don't have that authority to do that. I think probably what makes more sense, and I'd want to talk to uh, Bob Lewis and Karis, the, the new DPW director about this, is, is to just kind of, few, you know, kind of see if we want to set up a, a committee of interested people and start talking about this and, and trying to get our arms around, you know, kind of where we are and what we anticipate the issues are moving forward. But, but I mean, ultimately, I believe it would be the select board and the town manager who would make that decision about, you know, you know do we entertain the idea of, of you know, signing a new, new contract early. What I would say about that particular question, when I worked on Cape Cod and we were, we were basically dealing with this exact same issue this is about, you know, God, 12, 13 years ago now. And one of the ideas that was tossed around was, do we walk away from the relatively low cost contract that they had in place at that time? It was three or four years left in the contract. And there was value to the company that we had the contract with. But in exchange for walking away from that contract early, 
signing on to a new long-term contract at a lower price. So that was one of the negotiating strategies, if you will. Um, and then, then I ultimately left and took a new job. So I didn't, I didn't get the chance to see that through, but that was one of the thoughts that we had there at the time. So there's a whole range of ways you can go about this, Wells, but that is one. Thanks. Um, yeah, that, that matches with kind of like the oil lock-ins that we do in condominiums, right? It's the same concept. You try to, you, you, you're willing to pay a little more to extend the contract and mitigate your risk. Um, yeah, so most of those things that you mentioned aren't things that we have control over. Um, so it seems like one of the few things we might have control over is trying to reduce the amount of waste we produce, right? Is that, is that something? Um, so, yes, I mean, and that, those are, that's very, very true, Wells. And, I, and I, I think I'm simply trying to, trying to point out those issues, not because we have control over them, but, you know, education and knowledge can be powerful. And oh, yeah, and I'm not I, saying you shouldn't. I, it's totally interesting. I'm just trying to understand what we can, what we should be focusing our energies on. And yep. one, the only thing that I can think of right off the bat is how can we reduce the amount of waste we're creating? I, I don't know if there are other things that we can, and the contract itself, but I'm not sure if there's anything else we can control. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I don't have a lot of answers right now for that, but, but you know, when, when we start, I think we start to think about like work that, the, that this group can do together to start thinking about and, and working with, you know, Green Needham perhaps and the select board and, and other, other interested um, um, entities in town and trying to get our heads around this because I, my, sus my suspicion about this and Wells, I think you, you hit on, hit it on the head is we, we can't really recycle our way out of this, but recycling is a, 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 one of the legs, if you will, of trying to address this problem. Uh, but also how do we, how do we, try to become more sustainable. And one of the ways to become more sustainable is to, is to purchase less. So be more, be more cognizant of it, more sensible about our purchasing practices. And, you know, trying to work with the schools and work with other entities in town to get this word out, you know, because very often it's easy to get the word out and tie it to kind of an impending, I don't want to call it a crisis, but an important issue that will have implications for the town. And so if you can, if you can kind of target who you want to get that message out to based upon your understanding of the issue, um, I think that's work that we can kind of do together. Thanks. Greg? Yes. Do, do you anticipate um, having uh, the negotiate the, renegotiate the Willibrator contract um, and continue with, continuing with that in after five years? Well, well I, I'm, I'm assuming, I, I mean, again, I, I, I haven't, I, I don't really feel I'm empowered to, to have those discussions. I, I do have relationships with, with Wheeler Brader staff. Um, I, I, I imagine Wheeler Brader's, you know, going to be in business for five years and 10 years, and, you know, they'll be looking to lock up waste. Um, it just as part of their normal business practice, uh, you know, through the, through contracts, long-term contracts. So that I do believe that's a viable option for the for the municipality to consider. Now, whether that's done through a consortium of like-minded um, municipalities with the with the objective of getting a lower price tip fee because it's a group of towns and not just one town looking to uh, have a contract with Wheeler Bread, that would be my recommendation. Um, but there are other viable alternatives out there, and I think that you know this is just part of a process that I feel the town should begin to think about going through, evaluating what those alternatives are, are they viable, are they not viable, and then, you know, honing, focusing in on the one or two that are most viable and pursuing, uh, you know, whatever, wh whether it's a new contract or a broken contract, and whatever, whatever you might want to do. Because uh, I just remember the, the last time we negotiated the wheel operator contract, it was very complicated because uh, there was the, the consortium that, I, that we were we had some constraints around and we had to wait for some others to do some of the things but it was almost a <clears throat> I think a three you know if anyone recalls um, who was around then it was almost a three-year process of sort of negotiating the, the contract um, I think you know we were sort of updated around the complications about it pretty early on as 
you know, it, it got to, you know, your, your management level. I think that was done between, you know, the previous superintendent and, 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 and Rick and, and, and David. Um, so imagine, and I, and I imagine any other contract that you negotiate at this level, if it's not Wheelabrator or anybody else or alternatives, um, even diverse uh, things, is they're com complicated negotiations um, that take some time, right? And yeah, Jeff, I, I just you know, the, here here's one observation about you know kind of need them, and, and there's been a lot of talk uh, at the kind of managers level about kind of the dynamics of Needham changing in, in, in a very progressive, positive manner. And I think that there is, you know, there's going to be a desire and a need for like information sharing, you know, you know collecting information and sharing it and, and discussing. And I think to your point about what may have, ha this certainly happened before my tenure. Um, and I think Harris was very involved uh, and, and Rick, Rick was as well, the previous director and, Dave, in in that in that contract renegotiation with Wheelabrator, but you know these are complex um, uh, issues that aren't you know resolved in, in a month or whatever. And I guess I just kind of think with the with the some of the changes that are going on in the community, you know, the the, the need for information sharing and being very you know the, the outreach and the inclusiveness and and having these kind of discussions. I think that's why I'm trying to get people to start thinking about it now because. It, because it's it's not these are not easily solved challenges i think they're magnified by issues that i tried to highlight tonight um about the lack of capacity and no additional waste to energy you know some of the other challenges that the state of massachusetts and new england are facing that are going to that are going to need to be understood and that I think we're going to have to be part of the strategy, if you will, when we try to figure out what we're going to do here, not just with trash, but with the other specialty waste that the town generates and has to handle. I think that um, <clears throat> the kind of information that you share and anticipation of things, you know, um, uh, is very impressive. I know for a fact that when you make presentations to the select board, it, you know, and when you've done it in the past, that um, it, it they were very they were very, very impressed. They were very happy to be well informed, and um, they felt like uh, things were in good hands with uh, the DPW and uh, the superintendent. The trans there was a lot of trust in the the decisions that were made you know, at, at that level because of your presentations of, uh, uh, of the, the, the larger picture uh, as well as the, the, the amount of information uh, that, that you shared. So certainly I would encourage, you know, that we, when, when their time allows with a select, the select board, maybe in the fall, um, to get this, this presentation to them as well. And I think that will make, you know, the ease of decisions with uh, contract negotiations uh, easier on the, on the home front. Well, 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 certainly thank you. Thank you, Jeff, um, for that. And I, and I do feel one of my, really one of my primary roles is to be a, um, you, know, you know, to bring information to, 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 my, to, to my senior management team and, and to, to you all that's really one of my one of my primary charges here so that we we can co kind of collectively make good decisions about you know what's the best way to move forward so um, I, I take that role seriously and it's something i enjoy doing thank you thank you um so, greg so, yeah i just i i you know i um, down here in florida you know about five years ago they just built in our county a municipal solid waste waste to energy facility you know they spent 672 million dollars building it yeah but it's it's a very clean operation it handles 3,000 tons a day of municipal solid waste and seems to be very functional going forward and there hasn't been any issues that i'm aware of or have read about it is can something be done at a great higher level than each little town in Needham trying to figure out what 
how to deal with it because this is a problem that affects the entire state. I could talk to uh, Governor Governor uh, Baker about that and the and the legislature. That's right. But the question is, we've got to move that up the political ladder and have it addressed. You know, Needham can't address its municipal solid waste issues by itself, nor can any, any one town. You need to have a larger body taking care of a, a situation like that. And I just don't understand wh why we're sitting here and being concerned about what's gonna happen because there's nothing new for the next 15 years. So, Steve, what, what I would say is, um, you know, we, we, we do have, we do have, you know, representation uh, in the legislature here in Needham, maybe a good place to start. I would offer that. Um, but you are correct. I mean, this is, this is a statewide challenge. Uh, you know, the, the operators, you know, the waste management and the Republic, you know, waste service, uh, these large companies that operate in Massachusetts are operating within the regulatory framework uh, that the state provides. And so if there's a desire to change that regulatory framework, that much of that work will have to be done in collaboration with the legislature. So talking to the local rep may be a decent place to start after maybe there's a more thorough understanding of the issues and, and maybe, you know, offering up some recommendations. Um, and I, you know, as I, as I talk to, to my, my managers, if that's, if that's something that they're interested in pursuing, I'd be happy to work on that. Mm -hmm. um, so to continue, just a couple of other uh, updates for everyone here. So some operational, some operations updates. So just, I wanna focus in on the compost area, just again, for, for, for wells in particular, but some of this is maybe repetitive. Um, as a result of, of all of that material that gets brought to the, uh, the drop-off area, uh, the compost area, all the leaves, the grass, the, the brush, we end up producing about 8,000 cubic yards of compost annually. So, it, so we have one of the largest in Needham, one of the largest municipal <coughs> composting operations in the state. There are larger private entities, but we are one of the largest municipal composting operations in the state. That compost is sold uh, primarily to AgriSource and also to residents. And the compost is also used by other DPW divisions for town projects. So it's a great, it's a great service to the community and it does provide revenue to the, to the, to the town. It's all, you can also think of it as kind of a cost avoidance operation. We, we are not doing what some other municipalities are doing, which is to pay money to get rid of that or to recycle that material with a private contractor. So we're not doing that, we're handling it on site and, and it does provide a great service to the town. You know, it's kind of, it was kind of funny. I was preparing the presentation and I was going back and looking at some historic photos and it's just emblematic of how fast time goes by. But this was taken about six years ago, not long after I was hired. And um, if, you, if you recall, um, it was a little bit busier down there than it is today. Um, and I just took some of these photos. I was like, wow, it's, it's, a lot has changed down there. And uh, there was just kind of piles and piles of stuff uh, from about six years ago. And if you look, I think I just showed these photos, but you know, uh, the staff, I, 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 I try to do this and I do it sincerely. The staff has done a fabulous job down there, um, you know, working with the, with, with the other divisions and the other departments in town to basically clear the decks and to, to, to bring, you know, organization and, and order um, to that operation. So it's, it's working out well. And then also another project down there is the materials processing area. And again, kind of just a, a photo from six years ago when I started and was fairly busy down there. And as you may uh, remember from uh, late last fall, early last winter, uh, the town through a capital appropriation uh, brought in a contractor, constructed 12 of these interlocking uh, concrete block bins. And uh, last fall, it looked like this. It still largely looks like that now, but again, bringing a lot more order and uniformity 
um, to that operation down there. And that's really what we're striving to do uh, at the transfer station. Um, I wanted to bring something else to your attention because I don't recall if we discussed this, um, but some time ago, the town uh, voted a $100,000 capital appropriation to procure um, 12 big belly trash and recycling containers. And those containers were dispersed in uh, area, three areas throughout the town. And the idea was to see if those big belly deployments under this pilot program would provide benefits to the municipality. So uh, they were, there were uh, five of them located in Memorial. There were four of them located in DeFazio or DeFazio. After, after seven years, you'd think I'd get that right, my apologies. And then two were located to Greens for a total of 12. And as a result of that four month pilot program, uh, this, the, the, a report was generated and there was a series of findings uh, that kind of came to our attention. And I'll just run through these briefly. Uh, so it did minimize illegal dumping. The big bellies do minimize. They don't stop, but they do minimize illegal dumping. They certainly do reduce windblown litter. They certainly do reduce overflowing barrels. They negate odors and they deny easy access to the trash from vermin or for vermin. They certainly do provide a neater physical appearance. They increase the efficiency of trash and recycling collections from the, the packer truck that works out of the RTS. And it has helped reduce the number of trash related C click fix requests. So, I, so there's a report available. If you want me to share that link with you, I certainly can. Just send me an email and I'll be happy to share that with you. Uh, there's a lot more information in there about the pilot program. But these are just some of the basic, uh, uh, some of the findings from that, from that four month pilot program. And just so you're aware, as a result of the town procuring the big bellies, it's been a, a little more than a year now that we've had them in town and we have started to change the location of the big bellies that we procured because we've observed that there are some areas in town where they are presently deployed, where they may not be getting the highest usage. So we're looking at alternative sites and you may see big bellies someday uh, not located where they historically have been and are in other parts of town. So we're working on a plan right now to, to uh, relocate some of them. But uh, the feedback that I've had is that they, uh, they are a welcome addition to the community. Uh, my staff uh, likes them. And, um, you know, I, I don't know whether we're gonna see a significant increase in the number of big bellies in town, but I do know that two more are in the process of being ordered uh, to be located up at the high school. So I wanted to bring that to your attention. Uh, with regard to uh, anticipated operations for FY22, so we are on tap to have a rock crushing event in the materials processing area. Uh, I've targeted August for, for that activity. And part of the reason that is, is for the rock crushing operation is because we have the materials processing area um, and we have the, the, the storage bays out there, we now have a much more focused, consistent uh, processing operation for all the incoming aggregates from municipal projects. And we, we've been able to store up a large amount of material that's suitable for rock crushing and for reuse. And the great thing about that is now what we're doing, instead of spending money sending that to a place like FedCore at expense, is we're storing it on site, we're processing it, and we're able to reuse it interdivisionally. So I look at that again as a cost avoidance operation, which is actually good for the town. We will be replacing our existing hazardous waste storage shed this summer or this fall. We are doing uh, some uh, work with, the, with our, our Weston and Sampson. They're our contractor who does our landfill uh, monitoring. And they're gonna be uh, repairing some damaged uh, wells in July. 
We're going to be making some repairs to our, our existing anti-litter fencing and some other fencing uh, at the RTS. Again, this is just all, you know, maintenance type work, but it's work that I want to stay on top of because, you know, staying on top of it results in uh, lesser cost to the town over time. We are planning on, although I, this is not definitive, but we are planning on reconstituting the organics recycling program at all of the public schools uh, in the fall. Now, whether that happens in September, October, November, or whether it even gets pushed back until next year, that I can't predict. So a lot of it is COVID related and driven by, by, the, uh, by, by how well that's gonna work out over the next several months. But again, that's something that the DPW funds and that service is contracted out to a company up in Maine and they come down and they actually collect it and they use it in their anaerobic digesting process. So this is a program that we had to sideline as a result of COVID, but uh, I'm hopeful that that will be reconstituted at some point in the future. And uh, we do quarterly brush grinds at the RTS. A brush grind is bringing the tub grinder in and basically grinding up the logs and the brush and the Christmas trees that everyone brings. And it's just one of the ingredients of making good compost. Hey, Greg, and um, also, one quick um, note on the organics recycling. I think you mentioned to me, and, and it might just be good to people to know that that's actually a requirement, right? A DEP requirement that no one's coming in and inspecting us, but theoretically we're supposed to be doing it, right? Yeah, thank you, Wells. That, that's a good point. So the, the Department of Environmental Protection has a series of waste ban items, um, many of which have been in place for a long time. So you're, you're, we've been recycling tires and cardboard and glass and paper for many, many years. And every once in a while, the DEP adds to the waste ban item list. And um, there has been, uh, for the last couple of years now, a commercial organics recycling ban in place. So if you're a commercial entity, not a residence, but if you're a commercial entity and you are generating more than one ton per week of organics waste, you are subject to the ban and you have to put in place an infrastructure to recycle that material. Now that, that commercial ban has been in place for a couple of years now. The DEP recently has come out and indicated that they are going to put in place a revised commercial organics recycling ban for commercial entities that generate a half a ton or more of organics material. And so, so my desire when we first began contemplating two years ago about instituting an organics recycling program at the schools wasn't necessarily to comply with the ban. It was more just because it, I, 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 and I shared with the previous director and, and my boss and so on that I thought it was good practice for the community given that the that their, the town is looking to become more sustainable it's a great sustainable program it you know it's it, you know the btu value of, of, of wet sloppy food waste is pretty minimum and that there may be a better way to handle that material so that really was the was the was the was the goal of the program was to, to make need more sustainable but now we have these bans in place so we will be in compliance with the ban um, because schools are are, are considered uh, part of the ban. So if you're so if you're a, if you, you're a school and you're generating more than a half a ton a week of of food waste, you have to comply. So we're hoping to reconstitute this program um, so that uh, the schools will be in compliance with this new ban that's not been formalized and put into place yet, but it is impending. I hope that was clear. Oh. Um. Going back to the rock crushing, if you don't mind, are we encouraging or allowing or even allowing um, ordinary citizens to bring rocks to the RTS? So, so, so I mean, is that, is that something that you want to happen or? Uh, it, it is, it is sure not. what the attitude is toward rocks. <laughs> <laughs> so good question, uh, Dave. It, we, we actually, uh, we previously had a program where residents could drop off rock and brick and block and, right. you know, and, and all that sort of flagstone. And um, 
and it, it just became very challenging to deal with. And so a decision was made to stop the program. Now, people are still generating that material, but what we have is, is, is we have provided people the names of companies in the area where they can bring that material to if they wish to recycle it or dispose of it. Um, but no, we do not have a, a formal program to accept that anymore. It just became, it became problematic for a number of reasons, which I can go into if you'd like, but the, the bottom line is the program does not exist at the RTS anymore. And, and presumably it brings in no revenue, is that? It never did. It resulted in a cost to the municipality. Okay, thank you. And uh, with regard to some other, uh, these, some of these are, are new programs, some of these are existing programs, but we do our annual hazardous waste collection event. It'll be October 16th of this year. And we also do paint collections on the third Saturday of every month between April and October. As a matter of fact, this past Saturday was our first paint collection event of 2021. So those are something we do for those months, third Saturday. And lastly, we do our leaf collection events every Sunday uh, during the month of November, though that's our banner month. We see massive inundation of leaves. And that, that photo I showed earlier, I think showed you that large pile. Um, so th that uh, largely concludes my presentation um, for this evening. Does anyone have any questions? I guess the Casella rep wasn't able to make it today, huh? No, I, I, I did not. Um, I was not able to confirm their their commitment for, for the evening. Okay, that, that just Excuse a quick. I did, uh, sorry, uh, Greg and I had talked about uh, having it be helpful to have the Casella rep um, give some context and, and talk about their signage and this and that. But maybe we'll do it another time. Um, Greg, could you send that um, PowerPoint presentation to me? Yes, yes, Thank I you. can. Uh, um, if I could just say one last thing, and and Wells, you just reminded me of this. Um, the the town is an annual recipient of what are called recycling dividend program funds and um we do have um, um we do have funds escrowed presently um, um in the accounting department and so as i was looking at some new information that i received from the dep and they're always changing um, the program, tweaking it to make it, you know, more suitable for the municipalities. And one of the things that I was happy to read about, it was just last week, was that um, an, an eligible expense for RDP funds is they will pay for new signage at transfer stations, which is great because signs cost a lot of money. They were part of the operating budget, but now if I can shift that over and use the RDP monies to pay for that expense, that's, that's a benefit <clears throat> excuse me, certainly to the RTS operating operating budget into the town. So I was happy about that. I've already reached out to our sign contractor to, to begin looking at signs and and hoping to move forward um, to utilize that money for that for that purpose. So um, Greg, I'd love to work with you on those signs, um, especially after having visited Wellesley, if we if I could be a part of that with you. I'm I'm always happy to have people work with me on these things. That's fantastic. Oh, and you know, well, and I'm so happy. I know you and I have spoken numerous times about this, but for everyone on the call, if you haven't had a chance to go to the Wellesley transfer station, it's, a, it's really kind of a, of a, of a great stop locally to get a sense of how a sister community, you know, handles uh, their trash and recycling. Now they have a very different program from Needham's because they don't do dual streams. They do, a, they do a very, very comprehensive source separation of basically everything. They've had that program in place for many, many years now, and they've got a larger staff than Needham does. But they also have various aspects of their operation that I have found rather interesting and trying to gain a sense of, you know, whether there wouldn't be a benefit to need them giving consideration to adopting some of their practices. So I've been spending some time over there talking to the superintendent and the foreman about that operation. But if you get a chance to go over there, just introduce yourself. They're great people and just, hey, you know, I'm, I need them, et cetera. 
but putting eyes on how another community comparable in size to Needham, how they handle their material, um, you know, might not be a bad use of your time. So I yeah, I went over there. Was they were very friendly. I spoke with the, the assistant superintendent for an hour, and I also asked a couple of random Wellesley residents how difficult they feel that it is to separate their stuff, and they said it just takes a couple minutes, um, and they gave some suggestions. So anyway, it was interesting. Well, I, I certainly appreciate your time this evening and your attention. Um, I'm always available by email or phone call. So if you have any, think of anything or, or you want to talk about what you learned tonight, happy to, happy to speak with you. But thank you. Thanks, Greg. Mr. Chair, the next item is uh, RTS rates. <clears throat> and uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, um, just to bring the uh, committee up to date, we are not looking at making a recommendation to the committee to consider an increase to the paid to throw bags for the upcoming year. Um, one coming out of COVID-19 uh, to the extent that we can keep rates uh, level, uh, that's a good thing. And uh, that's been an emphasis of the select board in, in many areas. Secondly, for some of the topics that um, that Greg touched upon earlier, uh, we'll be looking to entering some new contracts that will impact our cost of disposal, which will give us a better picture of our total cost for disposal to make a determination whether or not uh, the pay to throw bags need to increase. So in the area of pay uh, to throw uh, and uh, conversely, the over the scale rate, we would not uh, be looking at making any adjustments. However, we have a couple of minor things for consideration, not uh, for this evening, but to bring it to the committee's attention to be taken up in the next couple of meetings. Um, um, and there are four areas. One was looking at uh, possibly implementing a commercial mixed paper fee. Uh, the next thing is uh, looking to increase the uh, penalty for one who violates the pay to throw, the lack of using a pay to throw bag uh, penalty, which is currently $5. Um, looking to, for commercial operations, uh, implementing a uh, fee for the disposal of uh, fluorescent light bulbs. And um, lastly, looking to adjust our price for the purchase of compost and uh, in loan. Um, at a future meeting, we'll uh, have a sense of some scenarios in those rates. But uh, if any questions of why we're looking at those four at this time, uh, we're certainly open to questions. I'll just say that the price of the compost and the loam is basically nothing right now. So uh, compared to what you buy it anywhere else, um, it would certainly make sense to me to at least charge something. And then uh, to the committee, uh, the next item on the agenda is the billing and collection software. Um, it just, uh, just more of an FYI the committee may find interesting. The town's uh, major billing and collection revenue system is a, uh, is a uh, application that was uh, procured in the early 90s. It's uh, basically um, 1980s technology. Used to be, for folks that remember these terms, green screen. Um, a type of operation worked off a, a and still does work off an AS400 uh, box. Uh, the software has served the town well uh, in terms of its uh, our billing for the property and personal property taxes for motor vehicle excise, water and sewer charges, uh, RTS fees, um, uh, details and a host of uh, a number of other uh, major receivables Town meeting approved an appropriation uh, back in October um, to provide the funding to procure a new system. 
and uh, we have uh, started that process. Um, I, um, over the next uh, several months, we should have an RFP out on the street and uh, we'll be collecting proposals and evaluating them during uh, tw a calendar year 2021. Uh, to the extent uh, that uh, we are still billing uh, companies because uh, something that we've been transitioning to is actually having people pay uh, for service when they arrive at the RTS. But some of the commercial operations, understandably, we still need to bill. Um, we would be billing them through this new application uh, once we secure that. So other than just to let the committee know the town is doing that, you may find it interesting that we're looking to update a, uh, a system that's over 30 years old. There's really nothing else on that. Certainly, um, if you have any questions, I and, and the town treasurer, Evelyn Paness, who's joined us, can answer any questions. Dave, I have a question on the software. It's not really related to the RTS, but to the extent that it's being used by the other enterprise funds, is any of the cost of that plan to be borne by those enterprise funds? The answer is yes, their allocated share of the cost, um, particularly water and sewer, as you can imagine, has a, a significant impact and that annual license fee that we pay is um, reimbursed to the general fund by uh, the water and sewer uh, operations. Hey, Steve, hey. I, I, had, I had a similar question that was uh, uh, just answered uh, through that. Um, so <clears throat> I did, I'm sorry, I was muted when you were talking about um, the in, uh, increase in fees. Today that I, what was the mixed paper fee? Can we go back to that? Um, Certainly. Greg, did you want to take that? Yes. So Dave did list out the, 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 the fees, the proposed fees. And again, I, I, I simply, um, you know, I evaluate the fees on an ongoing basis. I make recommendations. I haven't had an opportunity to discuss this uh, formally with the assistant director or the director to get their um, recommendation. But the thought process behind the mixed, the commercial mixed paper fee is that at the present time, the only commercial fee that is assessed for recyclables is single stream. And we take in very little single stream from our commercial haulers. However, we take in comparatively larger volumes of mixed paper from the contractors at no expense to them. There's no tip fee. But where do they put, do they put that in the, in the same bins that um, residents put in the dumpsters? Yes, they do. And it would be great if they brought a lot of cardboard because we get revenue from that, but <laughs> I think the fixed paper is, uh, is a cost, is that correct? Yes, so mixed paper is an expense to the municipality, whether, it's, whether you're a contractor dropping off at the RTS or whether you're a resident. Now, as my presentation showed, recently the cost for recycling mixed paper, those costs have decreased. Uh, but historically those costs have been, you know, relatively high. But I think what's important to understand is the town is not getting inundated with tons of material from the commercial haulers. But it more is an issue that I wanted to bring to people's attention to say, it does the town wanna to continue providing at no cost this service to the commercial haulers or for the purposes of you know, fair play and you know, uh, is that is a fee as we have for single stream, something that the town wanted to entertain. So it was just part of what I feel is my due diligence to bring the issue to, to, the, to the board and to have the board make a recommendation after I speak with my, my bosses. Does the commercial, um, if, they, if they bring it to other towns, do they get the, um, you know, get it for free um, or do they have to pay? Uh, Jeff, I can't answer that question. That I don't know. 
<laughs> but but what I, what I would say is, you know, Needham is not unique in, in 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 the fact that we pay to have our mixed paper um, recycled. You know, again, we have a we have a contract with Casella, and if you're bringing right. your materials to Casella, you're paying to get rid of mixed paper or to recycle it, I should say, to recycle mixed paper. So I think whether you brought it to well, I don't want to say Wellesley because I'm not sure what Wellesley does, but I'm, a, I'm assuming there would be an expenser because Wellesley has to take that material and, you know, separate it out and then all the costs that are associated with that. So I, I think it's a fair thing to say whether you brought it to Needham, whether you drove it across the town line someplace else, there's very likely an expense associated with it. And fluorescent bulbs, there's no fee at the, currently for that, is that correct? There is not a fee associated with anyone recycling fluorescent light tubes. That's a, that's a program that we encourage. However, our current program does not allow contractors to bring in fluorescent light tubes. We have a fairly small program that works very well for residents to bring their fluorescent light tubes in and recycle them at no cost. But we have recently had requests from companies to bring in large volumes. And we are not presently easily set up to handle those volumes. So we did a review of invoicing and, and tried to determine what our costs were per fluorescent light tube for recycling. And so if we wanted to broaden that program and allow for our contractors to bring in larger volumes of that, I simply think that it's fair to the municipality to assess a minor fee to cover the municipality's cost to recycle, because there is a cost to recycle that that come on. There is a cost to the, there's a cost to you when you have to you know, get it taken away. There's a cost to the municipality for that program to recycle fluorescent light tubes. Yes. So historically, uh, I mean, it's great that we have a program for residents because we certainly want to keep the the mercury out of the the waste stream and then mm -hmm. disposing of it. So. Uh, for that purpose for residents, that's great, given especially that they don't have uh, that. The, the previous superintendent um, found out, inherited, I think, that Owen was and Babson were using uh, us to, uh, when they came time to, with, with their fluorescence. And um, she, put a, she had to put a stop to it and say, uh, you know, you're taking advantage of of a, 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 a cheap or free program uh, to do that. So um, historically, they're, I think they're, they're looking to do that. So I think it, it's probably a great advantage and a service for a, for a fee for, to, to allow that. And if you can handle the increase, because uh, you can understand how many fluorescent bulbs maybe, you know, Babson and, and, and uh, Owens uh, has. Um, yeah, and I, I want to be clear about this issue. You know, we, we are not talking about, you know, a lot of money. I, I mean, it's a very, very nominal fee that I'm recommending for the recycling, but I just think it's, it, it's a question of, uh, I believe, fairness, that the municipality is incurring an expense to recycle these, and thus, if a commercial entity wants to recycle them, I think it's fair to pass that cost on to that, to that company. Um, but that's just my recommendation if that's the position of the advisory board and the select board. I think if, if other people want to speak up, uh, you know, this committee has, has often been supportive of around um, the, the fairness issue. And we certainly inquire about what other towns uh, do because that's certainly fair, a fairness thing. And we don't want to um, impose fees that would then, you know, cause that people to go outside of there, but we want to be, you know, fair and, and consistent. And I think that, um, you know, uh, thank you for the, you know, thank you for anticipating that. Um, if anyone else wants to speak, I, I feel supportive of all the things that are sort of um, listed here and look forward to, you know, uh, discussing and voting on, on those. Hey, Greg, one, uh, I, I agree. I, I'm supportive of, of looking at um, implementing new fees for these items that it's probably uh, long overdue to take a look at some of these items. One item I would, one thing I would just uh, caution is if you do move forward with expanding the fluorescent light program, I would just uh, recommend that the town limit that to contractors that are servicing um, municipal, you know, uh, homeowners 
um, collections as opposed to institutions and other businesses um, like the example that Greg had provided because you you do you could get into um, getting into commercial uh, waste regulations that the town probably doesn't want to get involved with at that point. Uh, yeah, and, and Bill, that's a good point. And I think what I would say to this is, um, this is not a program that I would want to um, publicize, you know, make public, you know, but, but it is something that, that the staff has uh, notified me about that they are turning away on occasion contractors who have, a, and, and I, I don't recall what the volume of tubes were, but we've had to turn them away because our structure does not allow us to take in any more than a de minimis number, which is, which is in sync with, with what, the, what the residential generation rate would be, or the recycling rate would be for fluorescent light tubes. So, I mean, again, it's, uh, I'm not looking to, you know, uh, broaden the Brought in the program to where you know the Hilton is changing out fluorescent light tubes in their 500 room hotel, and they want to bring their fluorescent tubes to meet them. I'm not. That's not what I'm looking to do. I'm simply looking to institute a program where on the occasional contractor comes in and they've got tubes they want to get rid of. We can accept them, and we can pass that cost along. David? You're on mute, Dave. Thank you. Um, unless there were any other questions, did you want to jump to the future meetings agenda item? Which sort of piggybacks on the conversation we just had. And uh, Mr. Chair, I would, was recommending for the committee's uh, consideration that the next meeting would be on June 15th for the purpose of actually uh, coming forward with uh, some uh, with details about uh, any rate changes that uh, that we would be recommending for the committee to consider with uh, with the next date being July 6th uh, if if necessary that uh, if there were still questions or things that the committee would like us to come back gone with planning with consideration that we would present to the select board uh, of their meeting of, of uh, July 20th. And then for the balance of calendar year 2021, uh, I would propose and June 15th, September 21st, in November 16th, they're all the third Tuesday of the month. Okay. And Dave, I would, can, Dave, can you email those out to us? Uh, yes, if the committee uh, is uh, is acceptable to these, I'll uh, push out Outlook invites. I would assume for the time being that, uh, uh, well, I know that the June 15th, July 6th um, meetings will definitely be electronic uh, because the earliest anything could happen is not until uh, the end of July. But for planning purposes, I, I, I would assume for all of us that the meetings for June, July, and September will be remote via Zoom. And then perhaps by November, we'll be able to be back in, in person. Can I jump? Yes, uh, obviously um, the, the June 5th meet me, 15th meeting is very important because that will be, um, we will be presented on something that we'll probably have to vote on. Is that correct? And, and we'll, and then if, if, and, and June and July 6th is, if we need to continue a uh, discussion or vote again before presenting to the selectmen. So those two meetings are, are sort of important in the progression of things, correct? That's correct. And then September and November is to get it into your calendars so that- if I, So before we get, before we settle on that and get ready to close, I just, I, I think I would like to raise the Nuari uh, item on the 
agenda that what's well, not on the agenda for items that are not included that I when I forwarded that at the request of the select board for people to look at. Um, so I would that be something that we would need to discuss at our, our next meeting. And, and maybe maybe uh, management could give us uh, an idea of the kind of things that we are trying we have to consider. Um, I, I sort of I, I feel sort of a little out of sorts about you know what are you know our input in regards to um, operations and fairness and non-discriminatory practices. Uh, I, I guess if we had concerns that as an advisory committee in regards to those guidelines, we, we could raise them. But again, I think, um, you know, Needham staff and um, operations have to pay attention to those things. And, and, I, and I, I would hope and trust that they are pretty fair in regards to uh, those kind of racial issues. Um, I don't know what other, what other people's feelings are, and I don't know exactly how much the, the, the select board and the URI is looking um, for us uh, in response to this. And I don't know if anyone else has any ideas upon reading that document or what our input does go into that. So thank you, David, if you could give, give us some guidance. Um, Mr. Chair, I think you uh, summed it up uh, very neatly. Uh, certainly, are, if there are issues or uh, observations that the committee uh, would uh, like to share with the select board, uh, it would be um, appropriate to, and certainly added to the June agenda. Uh, secondly, of course, since uh, by that time, town meeting will have spoken there is a resolution that is gonna be presented to town meeting and discussed and, and voted upon, uh, which I think will give uh, more clarity. Uh, the importance of that was making sure that every committee and board in town uh, was aware of the message, was aware of, uh, of the activities that the board has undertaken in the steps that the community itself is hoping to see. And that, uh, and that was the first step to many, many meetings. This is not going to be something that's, okay, we've made a nice vote, everything's wonderful. This is an ongoing, organic and growing, um, uh, growing realization uh, of, um, of slights and, um, and missed opportunities that we're hoping we're not gonna miss in the future. I, I do have a comment about, um um this area um and that is um i did carefully read the document i don't know if um the rest of you saw it, the document that um stated a number of um so-called racist um incidents which occurred in needham um over the last period of time and i think there were something like hundred and something or 200, something like that. Anyway, but I read them all. And I must say, um, although this doesn't prove the case, perhaps, I must say that none of them, I believe, had anything to do with the RTS or um, our committee or anything that touches on what we do. So I think we should be proud of ourselves because we don't seem, as far as I can tell, we don't seem to be a problem. Um, I have never, I, as you know, I spend a lot of time at the RTS, um, perhaps more than most residents, and I have never seen a racist incident there. I have never heard of one. So again, that doesn't prove that something hasn't happened or won't happen, but I think we should be proud of that. 
I, I also um, read through the document um, and uh, I mean, to me, it, it seems like there, I could imagine two concrete things potentially coming out of it. Well, three, one is adopting it, right? And adopting it just would basically show support for the initiative. There's probably nothing that it would actually impact on us in terms of uh, too much other than that. Um, another one is the, the diversity of this particular group. So the main, one of the main things that the town is suggesting is that the actual committees have more diversity on them. And from that perspective, we are not diverse. Um, we are, um, you know, all white males. So that's, I mean, not, and not, I'm not, you know, knocking myself for being a white male. I'm just saying that that's one of the things that would be uh, a concrete step would be to try to recruit um, one or two members of color uh, or other, other groups. Um, and then the last thing is to, um, in any decisions or recommendations we make, it could be a step there to say, does this decision uh, disproportionately impact um, any of the communities um, that are underserved or um, you know, any of our other diverse communities? So I, I can see those being you know, three concrete steps. I will, I will save my 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 input and my rebuttal, um, you know, sort of that, and um, maybe we put this on the agenda item for um, for for next month. Um, you know, if people have ideas about diversity, I mean, uh, and recruitment, um, <laughs> it's not like we have a a large pool uh, of people that we are. Uh, you know, drawing from to fill in volunteer positions and that we're, you know, actively choosing, you know, the, the, the whitest individuals, you know, you know, I, I think, you know, but generally if someone expresses interest and they have a pulse, you know, they're, they're in, um, you know, so uh, in regards to this. No, and I certainly wasn't, I wasn't meaning to like, you know, for anybody to get defensive or take blame, I'm just saying, you know, should we ask the question, right? Is there anything we can do? That's and, and, and let's uh, uh, put it on the agenda for, for next week and, and let's talk about that. That is probably, you know, uh, you know, something people who um, getting <clears throat> active in this in this regard in, in the town and raising it as an issue across the board, maybe they need to re recognize the reality of, you know, of a volunteer, you know, volunteer government. Um, you know, here, okay, and that, and we could we can talk we could talk about that, you know, and and you know we have to be careful about you know certainly what we impose upon um, by by our, our staff, and again uh, I take the stand of not micromanaging because the the, the paid staff and uh, superintendents and so forth uh, management within our town have a lot to comply with in regards to operations as well as um, the the real life laws and not just uh, Nuari recommendations in regards to that. And I don't think we have any, I don't know if we have any concerns around that in regards to operations as well, but we could, we can discuss that on this agenda item next month. I, I was just going to say that um, I am in the process of becoming a Florida resident. So there will be an opening on the board shortly as soon as I make that determination as to where I am going to be living the rest of my life. You know, it's beautiful down here all, all year long. Um, will be an, an opening coming up on the board for the selectmen to look for a volunteer. More importantly is a point for all of us to realize just because we don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I've run into, you know, in my professional life, dealing with people, things that I never would have thought were sexual harassment. I have had people come to me and say, oh, that was sexual harassment. And you try to put yourself in their shoes as they're receiving it, not in your shoes, not with your experiences, you're gonna find out that it's sexual harassment. So there could very well be discrimination that we're not even thinking of in ways that we're not thinking of it because we are all somewhat similar 
and sort of, you know, been dealing with this process the whole time and we see it the way it is and we just go forward with it. But I think it, it is an enlightening experience to try to see things through another person's eyes and say, is there some way that we are not inclusive for certain people coming to the RTS, for certain people using the RTS, be it sexual or, or racial or ethnic? Um, so I'm not saying that they are there, but I'm just saying just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not. And um, when that opening does open, I mean, there may, I don't know, but maybe there could be some small amount of funds that's available to us to market the opening. Um, right now, there is no marketing for any of these openings. It's, you have to find it essentially on the website. So there are opportunities out there, I think, for this. So is, it, is, it, is this something that we would vote on adopting or is that not, I'm trying to understand what, what would the topic be? What, what would the concrete step be on the next meeting that we'd be doing about it? The, Discussing uh, what? It, it, yes. it, it's, it's the select board just looking for input from other boards and committees and, be, and to be aware that the community is moving forward. It's not, it's not requiring any sort of action and to the point that uh, the number of committees that this has gone out to, some committees only meet once a year or once every three years. Uh, it may it may not be obvious of what relevancy um, the, the the report would have, but the important step is to educate and inform. And and as the chair stated, uh, he received it from select board's office, and and to get out to the to the membership, so that a conversation would be to begin. Well, Steve, before you before you leave, shouldn't you have to find another a replacement for you? That's not my job. <laughs> you know, we in in, in um, we're a very diverse group in our our viewpoint and our political leanings. You know, so um, you know maybe we could look to find a, a balance of. Uh, you know, someone like-minded like you, Steve, a, a fiscal conservative, uh, you know. Uh, oh, that, that, uh, would, that, again, that would be up to the select board to make that decision. <laughs> they might no, I can't say I didn't, raise diver I didn't raise the diversity conversation. You know, I'm just, yeah. I was just going to wonder if they'd spend five hours discussing it or not. <laughs> I would just add if you if you're not aware and would like to uh, to hear more, all their meetings are recorded. They're all on the town's uh, YouTube site. It, uh, they met every Monday for many many months, and uh, I think it's eye opening and informative. Thank you. That that's. Helpful for some guidance for next week's, uh, next month's uh, uh, agenda. Yeah. Is, there a mo is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. I second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Did I have to do a roll call for adjournment, David? Yes, please. Oh, really? Wasn't that a roll call? Catherine, we, did you pick up that each member said yes? Yes, they did. Okay. I think you're free, and I think it's safe to say the committee is now adjourned. <laughs>